Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, my beloved brethren and sistren, to the Tawahedo Bible Study Podcast. We are still in the scroll of Revelation, or the scroll of uncovering, as always, the three S's. Make sure you subscribe, share, and support. You can subscribe wherever you are listening to this, be it Transistor, Anchor, YouTube, Google, Spotify, Apple, Wazata. You may share a link to where you heard this, or you may share the very words that you hear. I should have said and, or, and you can support by subscribing to aksum.substack.com. That's A-K-S-U-M.substack.com, where you can find a newsletter. Or you can see all of the projects listed out at patreon.com slash tawahado. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash tawahado, T-E-W-A-H-I-D-O. Today, I'm reading from the... N.T. Wright translation called the Kingdom New Testament, a contemporary translation. It's been a while since I have read from this translation. I'd like to switch it up to remind you pedagogically. Uh, it's a pedagogical tool. I'd like to remind you ped pedagogically that there is no perfect English version. So I'm just going to keep sifting through English versions until you all learn the Koine Greek and teach it to me so that we can stop reading the Bible in translation, or at least supplement our English reading with Koine Greek reading. Someone on uh, Twitter, one of my mutuals, was asking who were my favorite four theologians. And so, of course, I gave the names of three Bible scholars and one scholar of Syriac hymnography. Uh, that is Father Paul Nadim Tarazi, a friend, if not father, of this program. That is Likalikawant Abba Malaku, who is the Hebrew Bible head over at Kasate Berhan, the revealer of light, Abba Salama, or the Frumentius Theological College in Makala Tigray. Keep them in your prayers. The area is being airstruck right now. There's a civil war going on. So please pray for peace in Ethiopia. The third person, the Syriac hymnography studier or scholar, is the one and only Sebastian Brock. And the fourth person was the great N.T. Wright, uh, probably one of the best people in the Anglican Church, in, in addition to Sebastian Brock, since C.S. Lewis, who has a nice little uh, orthodox uh, mindset, as people say. He, he looks towards the East, but he stays right where he is, squarely in the West. Anyway, he has a very thought-for-thought -thought translation of the New Testament called the Kingdom New Testament, which is what I'm reading for. He calls it a contemporary translation, and I agree with him. We'll see what you all think of Revelation chapter 5. Without further ado, verses 1 to 5. I saw that there was a scroll in the right hand of the one sitting on the throne. The scroll was written on the inside and the outside, and it was sealed with seven seals. I saw a strong angel announcing in a loud voice, Does anybody deserve to open the scroll to undo its seals? And nobody in heaven or on the earth or under the earth could open the scroll or look at it. I burst into tears because it seemed that there was nobody who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. One of the elders, however, spoke to me. Don't cry, he said. Look, the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has won the victory. He can open the scroll and its seven seals. So we have the idea here of a scroll versus a book. Those of you who catch these episodes at the Ephesus School, at EphesusSchool.org, uh, the Ephesus School, uh, or at tawahado.transistor.fm are able to see the way in which I title it, which is different than how I title it elsewhere. And I title every book a scroll because you have to remember the context of the New Testament and the context of the Old Testament. Binding and books don't come until centuries later, centuries into the life of the followers of the way or what is later established and called Christendom. And so individual scrolls of individual books, which are considered very precious and which are very rare and hard to find, are kept in various places. And so you can imagine that in a culture of scrolls, the idea of a scroll being tied with scripture 
and the idea of the right hand being power, the right hand being able to destroy or to heal, uh, able to do a knockout strike or to massage is tied together. And the kind of scriptural authorship and right hand power, power of destruction and healing and KO striking and massaging is ascribed to the Lion of Judah who has conquered, who is victorious. This title was fallaciously and erroneously given to Ethiopian kings for many a century, from about 1270 to 1974. But thankfully, nowadays, most of us only subscribe to the idea that this title belongs to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Although you may still see some green, yellow, red flags with that lion on there, which is supposed to represent the Lion of Judah, let us all remember that lions are functional. There is the evil lion, which is represented by the devil who is always prowling around trying to see who he can consume in the Petrine epistles or letters. But here, because functionality stands, we have a good lion who is our Lord Jesus. So the devil and the Lord Jesus are represented by serpents in scripture and represented by lions in scripture, making both serpents and lions functional. The function here is conquering. The function here is victory. And with our Lord Jesus, that victory is always in loving, submissive, and shameful death. Verses 6 to 7. Then I saw in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders a lamb. It was standing there as though it had been slaughtered. It had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. The lamb came up and took the scroll from the right hand of the one who was sitting on the throne. So you may ask, what does this conquered, uh, this conquering lion of the tribe of Judah, this victorious lion of the tribe of Judah look like? Well, he looks like a slaughtered lamb, your shepherd, the one who is guiding you is a slaughtered lamb. How does that make you feel? How should it make you feel? Verses 8 to 10. When he took the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down in front of the lamb. They each had a harp, and they each had golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's holy people. They sing a new song, which goes like this. You are worthy to take the scroll. You are worthy to open its seals. For you were slaughtered, and with your own blood, you purchased a people for God. From every tribe and tongue, from every people and nation, and made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign on the earth. There are a lot of silly discussions about what instruments are important in the church it's, it's fascinating as an aside that most of the churches established their liturgy uh, when i speak of most of the church i'm thinking of the latin rite, the greek rite, the two afroasiatic rites that expanded to uh, even further rites, and finally the east syriac rite. that is the roman catholic church to the greek orthodox church which later includes the slavs the Afroasiatic, which are the Copts, and the West Syriac, which later include the Ge'ez and the Armenian and the Malankara, the Indians. Uh, then you have, of course, the East Syriac, uh, which is much uh, misaligned and maligned with the title of Nestorian for a long time, but now that is slowly getting rid of, and people are respecting them and calling them the Assyrian Church of the East. In any event, when you look at all of these traditions, all of their base liturgies are a cappella. And so really, we don't need to have arguments about instruments. But here you have a harp, and the harp is a beautiful instrument. It doesn't overpower the written word, which always reigns supreme for our literate community, which gathers around scripture. You have incense here, which is obviously an homage to a liturgical setting. And so us high church folks, us orthodox lowercase o folks and capital 
oh, folks get really excited when we see the incense. We love it. We say, add more smoke, please. And it is representative of our prayers. But if we are to remain humble or become or become humble, then we should always, whenever we see the word incense in the Bible, reread the scroll of Isaiah chapters 1 and chapters 66. Finally, there is one people being formed from every tribe and every tongue and every people and every nation. If you're a Scythian of the European steppe, no problem. If you're an Oromo cavalry member, no problem. If you are an Amharic speaker or a Tigrinya speaker or a Guraginya speaker or a Hadia speaker, no problem. If you are an Anglo-Saxon or a Greek, no problem. It doesn't matter what your tribe is. It doesn't matter what your ethnicity what your blood results on Ancestry.com or on 23andMe.com or, or what people you say you are from or what nation you were born in or you later got citizenship in because your ultimate citizenship is in submission to this slaughtered lamb who is your shepherd, who is forming you into one people to submit to the one God. We're going to see the superlative submission here in verses 11 to end of not just all of the human tribes, tongues, peoples, and nations, but all of the heavenly configurations as well. Verses 11 to 14. As I watched, I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders. Their number was 10,000 times 10,000, thousands upon thousands, and they were saying in full voice, The slaughtered lamb has now deserved to take the riches and the power, to take the wisdom, strength, and honor, to take the glory and the blessing. Then I heard every creature in heaven, on the earth, under the earth, and in the sea, and everything that is in them, saying, To the one on the throne and the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Amen, cried the four living creatures. As for the elders, they fell down and worshipped. Ten thousand times ten thousand is a ridiculous number if taken literally. It is one hundred million. Why such a perfect number? Because we are talking about a lot. I always draw people to the lovely Minnesota where my brothers and fathers in this ministry of the Ephesus School are based. And in their home base, it is known as the land of 10,000 lakes. That was before the people of Minnesota, the nice people of Minnesota, counted meticulously how many lakes there were. And later, they found out that their hyperbole was actually underwhelming, that there were more than 10,000 lakes. But it doesn't matter, because what we're talking about is a whole mess of heavenly beings who are in chorus, who are chorally with one voice submitting to the one God. Again, you have the liturgical act of the amen from the four living creatures or the four living beasts. You have bowing down in worship the 24 elders or the 24 presbyters. And in union, all the human creatures and beings from all the diverse places and all of the heavenly creatures are ascribing blessing and honor and glory and power for eons and eons to the one God. And when our focus is on that, when we're laser focused on giving blessing, honor, glory, power for eons and eons, forever and ever, unto ages of ages, then we are going to have a tough time sinning. God help us.